Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and uh, start our public meeting this afternoon. Um, before we do, I would like to uh, wish everyone a, a happy Valentine's Day. Um, we found out we had an incredibly informative session uh, this morning. Uh, a lot of wonderful information. And during the course of that, we found out that there was someone who will remain unnamed so that they're not in the public record. Um, is not a fan of Valentine's Day. We won't mention who that is, but we did learn uh, of that person's name, and we'll keep it confidential. Um, and if you could uh, let Mark know that I did that for him. <laughs> Just joking. Um, well, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting uh, to order, and uh, would Al Hubbard uh, uh, call the roll? Hi, Gal. Present. President. Oh, you're, I don't see you. <laughs> but he's I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Judge Fisher. Here. Uh, Colleen Gabbard. Lisa Hirschman. Al Hubbard. Here. Chris Lameau. Here. Chris Murphy. Kathy Parkinson. Here. Dan Peterson. Here. Beverly Pitts, John Pop, Alfonso Vidal, here. Uh, we've got a quorum, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Appreciate that. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite President Chuck Johnson to welcome us. Thank you, Chairman. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you.
terrific hospitality and the good work that you're doing. I really appreciate the healthy food that you offer us and hope that your colleagues and other universities will uh, follow through this completion. Well, thank you, Mr. We certainly strive to hit the biggest driver on that, which is the president's diet here in the East Wing. Thank you. Yes, I especially like the chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> As Kathy mentioned this morning, the Commission will host a faculty leadership conference tomorrow uh, at the Ivy Tech campus downtown. This conference will focus on community engagement and is sure to lead to informative discussions. Uh, at the conference, the winner of the inaugural Gerald Bepko Faculty Community Engagement Award will also be announced, and we will be announcing that publicly and to the members of our uh, Commission uh, who will receive it. Uh, be sure also to mark your calendars if you've not already done so for the Commission's two annual policy events, the State of Higher Education Address and the, Kel uh, the Ken Weldon Conference for Higher Education, which will be held on April 8th and 9th uh, of this year here in Indianapolis. And so we encourage all of our Commission members and, and others to mark their calendars for that event. The events will focus on the transition from high school to college and careers, and we're honored to have Matt Gandel with uh, Education Strategy Group and Governor Ever Eric Holcomb serving as our keynotes uh, for this conference. And we can expect to hear a lot more about this event in the, in the coming months. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Lovers for her report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at our working session this morning, we spent some time obviously talking about the legislative session, and I know looking at the room today, I know all of you are engaged in some way with the session as well. And I just wanted to reiterate something that Josh mentioned this morning, and that is that uh, this time we have 36 bills that have been offered that have some relationship with the Commission for Higher Education in terms of responsibilities. Uh, and that compares to about 15 um, last year and about 21 in the last budget session, I believe he said. I think the good news about this is that it gives us the opportunity to really work with you to frame this legislation so that it is actionable and that, um, really productive for the students in the state of Indiana. So a lot going on there. Shifting to the, the national front for a moment, I'm sure you also know that um, U.S. Senator Lamar Alexander, who is the chairman of the Health Committee, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, has been talking quite a bit about the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. It's been 10 years in the coming. Uh, I think none of us believe it's going to be smooth sailing even now. But nonetheless, he has indicated that he believes it needs to be tackled. And he's really cited a few issues in particular that I think would be important to us as well. One is the simplification of the FAFSA. And we're all very involved right now trying to make sure that more students complete that. His goal, whether it's achievable or not, I think is another issue. But his goal is to go from about 100 questions to somewhere between 15 and 25. Um, even if that isn't achievable, it certainly is clear that there seems to be an appetite for making that process more streamlined and simpler for students and families. He also refers to taking a scaffold um, to the federal system of loan repayment. I think the details of that are, are yet to be worked out, too. Probably a more controversial part of this really has to do with them implementing a new accountability system for schools, which would be based at least in part on the low repayment rates of the students and, and the, such things as the length of study of programs as well. I think a lot of details would have to be worked out on that. It also um, talks about um, reinstating Pell eligibility for uh, those who are incarcerated. This is certainly in keeping with Governor Holcomb's focus in this area as well of trying to provide new education and training opportunities for those. So I think this is showing some progress, but I think it's also clear to say that it's um, Speaking of Washington, and we thought that uh, Lisa Hirschman would be on the phone with us today, but was not able to join us. Um, I hope some of you saw um, a recent article that came out about Lisa. She is now serving as the Department of Defense's Acting Chief Management Officer, which actually has her as the third ranking civilian official at the Pentagon right now. Um, she's overseeing efforts at, in the procurement area, in 
trying to really cut costs. The bottom line is it's resulted in $4.7 billion saved over the last two years. And so she really has the charge of really focusing on efficiencies. Not surprisingly, she would ask us to focus on efficiencies as a commission as well. Um, but in her words, she said, we want to create a culture of thinking in terms of improvement and modernization and creating value. So goes to show, when you get a job done right, send in a Hoosier. <laughs> send in a Hoosier woman. Uh, so um, recently, I attended the uh, kickoff of the 50th anniversary celebration for IEPY. It was a great event. Among other things, it brought together um, all living Indianapolis mayors who joined the chance of really talking about the history and the importance of IUPUI to the greater Indianapolis community and certainly the state. It also reminded me that as a part of IU's bicentennial, and then of course we have Purdue coming to their 150 years, we have lots of celebrations going on that really speak to the service and longevity of our higher education institutions. But last week, I was, someone shared with me a story about Esther Gray, um, who actually was a member of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, served under three governors, was appointed in 1971 under Governor Whitcomb when the commission was created. Most of you will know that Esther Gray was married to U.S. Congressman Bill Gray. Uh, her son, Richard Gray, served in the state senate for many, many years, and her grandson, Robert Gray, is the uh, pro tem of the senate. Senate right now. Um, in the article, it said that, you know, had she been born at a different time, she might well have been a congresswoman herself. But that, and Roderick Gray said that he really contends that the political legacy of his family was really because of her and her drive. Um, she was an associate professor, a grandmother, a political strategist, and a trailblazer. In the article, it said she broke the mold of what it meant to be a female who was both interested in politics and involved in academia. So we don't often cite the contributions of those of, of people who serve on the commission, but at this moment in time, I thought it was interesting to reflect on this contribution that Esther Gray made for many, many years, from 1971 until 1992 on the Indiana Commission. Also gives me a chance to thank all of you who spend your time uh, with us making the work that we do so much better. Finally, uh, we learned on Tuesday that Scholar Track, we've talked to you lots of times about Scholar Track, our system for students, um, to make it's really like a one stop shop so that they know what they need to do uh, to plan for, apply, and persist in college. It has been named a, a nominee for the Mirror Award and the Innovation of the Year category by TechPoint, which is a very prestigious award. This is the second award that it's been nominated for. Um, another really significant validation, I think, of the platform that was created and the good work that's done by members of the Commission staff. And that concludes our report.
think, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think this is going to be a very important session this afternoon. And I mentioned earlier about all the ways in which commission members make our work better. And this really did, this idea really did come from commission members who, in looking at ways in which we could um, better achieve our attainment goal, better serve users, uh, trying to really look at a population that we've really not considered before, which is, we've talked a lot about getting people prepared for college, and we've, we've talked a lot about completion rates, but you know, what, what are we really doing? And I think we're doing a lot, we're gonna hear about any of those things today. Two, um, one, uh, I, identify students when we admitted them to our schools, who may be at risk in some way, even though they've met admissions requirements and we have every reason to believe that they can be successful, but they maybe have, have some extra challenges in terms of their academic preparation or other factors that we know might speak to whether or not they're going to be successful. So how do we identify them early? And then what happens during that time when they're, when they're with you so that we're doing everything we can to make sure that they're successful? Our first goal is not really to address what happens to students when they don't make it. Our first goal is to make sure that they are successful. But we know that not all of them are successful for a multitude of reasons. And so how are we then working with those students to transition them to the next part of their life with the understanding and the belief that if we can keep them engaged in their educational experience in some way, the likelihood of them improving their lives and then staying engaged in education is greater. So you know, what we really want to do with you today Thank you for spending the time, really the very thoughtful consideration you've given to this topic, which is, you know, how are you identifying those students when they come to you? How are you serving them when they're there? How are you helping them transition if they don't make it to another meaningful chapter in their lives? So, you know, we was mentioned earlier that we're gonna look at our welding conference this year as the, at the transitions from high school to college to making that more seamless. You know, what is that, what does that preparation look like? And, you know, we know we need to work with our K-12 partners, we need to work with our uh, employers in much more meaningful ways. We know that you're doing that, and we know this is a priority for you, and we think this is an opportunity for us to just maybe learn from each other, and then talk about some new opportunities that we may have as well, especially when we actually are losing our students and trying to get them back to that system. So each of the institutions, and we're doing this just in alphabetical order, each of our institutions have been asked to share about 15 minutes with us. Members of the commission have seen the response to the questions in advance. Um, if I know this group, they may well stop you during that 15 minute presentation with a question or two. If, if not, leave a couple minutes at the end that they can ask questions. And then we'll circle back around at the end again and, and have some time to think collectively about this. We've wanted um, no more time than usual for the public square today, both because of the number of because of the value of the topic itself. So um, we will start, and um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll just announce it between the next person coming up, uh, but there'll be no segue between these, so we'll just try to keep it going as best we can. But we'll start with Ball State University, Roman Royer Abel, who is the Interim Vice President for Student Affairs. Welcome. Sometimes that, that, that experience may be at risk for just the first year of their experience 
or we may say that based on retention rate, assistance rate, graduation rate, they may find them at risk for the entire college experience. Uh, so one of the groups that um, for us that we use, one of the ways that we indicate that is through um, our health recipients. And health recipients is one of the groups that we have identified at risk because of the historical retention and graduation rates of health recipients. Our 21st century scholars um, are students that we define as at risk, as well as we use some pre enrollment academic indicators like low high school, GPA, um, low test scores, and our RML risk indicators to be able to identify that. Um, previous to this 2019 cohort, Paulson didn't necessarily ask for whether students of this generation or not, and this is the first year that we will be asking that question to be able to identify when students come in, whether they are first generation, because we know that first generation students present their own risk with regards to retention and persistence. So, okay, we define that um, differently and then we determine whether a year or the full um, collegiate experience. And for us, one of the groups, pelvis students and 21st century scholars, are two groups that we work with and monitor through all their collegiate experience. So as we try to define um, how we uh, use that data, how we address our actual students, one of the things that we do is that we try to use data-informed and evidence-based practices in our approach. So we have used predictive analytics to prioritize first year students that we will do intrusive outreach to. And that is based on past years of data um, to identify before they come to orientation who are some of the students we want to reach out to, to involve in our summer bridge programs, key careers, and some of the things that we will help students be successful. We also have our 21st century scholars called a core member who works with our retention office. There are two additional professional staff and a graduate student who works within that office to target and to work specifically with our 21st century scholars. One of the things that I'm really proud of at Ball State is our summer bridge programs. We offer a variety of summer bridge programs. Um, some of them are free, some of them you pay for. But what we know is that students who participate in our summer bridge programs, which happens right before the start of the school year, are retained at a higher rate than students who don't. So one of the things that we do is, I, as we identify students who may have at-risk indicators pre-enrollment, we try to get them connected to the summer bridge programs, and in the past, have offered scholarships to students who may not be able to afford the summer bridge programs that they want to attend. At the same time, we know one of the key areas for students is figuring out their purpose and passion, a career, what are they going to do. At 18 years, sometimes they can't figure that out on their own, or they have an idea, but aren't confident in the career or major that they have chosen. So every student at Ball State during orientation does the My Vocational Situation um, test, and what it does is it measures career clarity or confidence. So coming in, we know students who are confident about their majors and those who may not be as confident about their majors. And then the Career Center works with these students throughout the year with different programs to help them get more confident about their major or choose a different major if they so um, choose, if they don't become confident in that. Then live and learning communities, um, as we do or uh, build new residence halls, live and learning communities have become an important part of the learning experience at Ball State, of the distinctive um, student experience that uh, we gave our students. And what we know is that students who live in live and learning communities are retained at a higher rate earn a higher GPA and earn more credit hours. So our focus in trying to get as many students in living learning communities and grow those living learning communities so that students can engage in their career and their major early in their first year is also important. 
Two other groups that we keep our eye on or we think um, may be at risk for us are our commuter students. So Ball City is, has a residency requirement, but students who live outside of a 60 mile radius, uh, within 60 mile radius, have the option to exempt out of that residency requirement. But at the same time, we know that students who choose that miss out on some of the things that help our other students be successful. So in 2008, we created a commuter program. We identify returning students who serve as ambassadors. They work with an academic advisor and our retention office to outreach to students and to be able to engage commuter students in a significant way. And we um, implemented the same thing in 2012 for transfer students because we were concerned of what we were seeing with regards to their retention. So we think that peer um, programs like ambassador programs are high impact evidence-based programs that um, certainly help students transition. On the academic side, um, we have an ID 101 one hour credit course that is offered every fall and spring. They're taught by academic advisors. One is targeted to students with undeclared majors to help them explore majors and options and who they are and how they figure that out. And the other one is really a transition course that offers students the opportunity to learn study skills and some of those interpersonal transition issues that first year students may, may have. So that is also offered. Um, students sign up on a voluntary basis. They are not assigned to those courses. Their academic advisors talk them through adding those courses as they advise them during orientation. L earlier this fall, you may have heard about the BSU Achievements app. And I wanted to put this in here because the BSU Achievements app started as an, in a specific program or initiative that targeted Pell recipients. Early I addressed that that's one of the groups that we identified we did not retain or there was a retain, retainment gap between students who were non-PEL and PEL students. So the achievements app was created and we saw significant closure in that achievement gap for PEL students. So beginning in this fall we opened up the, PEL, the achievements app to all students. But the Achievements app started as an initiative just for Pell recipients to address that. And then last but not least, the Learning Center, our academic support services we offer um, to students. Oftentimes, our retention office will refer students who are commuters, 21st century scholars, to many of the Learning Center programs, including academic coaching, which is really a targeted program that is only referral-based for students who are most in need or most at risk. And uh, what we know is that students who use our Learning Center services are retained and graduate at a higher rate than students who do. So what we have tried to do is look at what are the evidence-based practices we have and how do we get our students who are most at risk connected to those um, in some way. So how do we continue to monitor student progress? Uh, our academic advisors, we have a proactive professional advising model for first-year students. So in, no matter what the major is, first-year students have the same advisor. So if I change my major from English to biology, in that first year I do not change advice. I have the same advisor so that they are the ones who initiate, met in orientation and they can really help a student coach and develop that relationship. Uh, some of the things that our advisors do is work with our students to understand degree works, the four-year plan, help keep them on track. Um, we do a pre-registration advising, so before the first end of the first semester registration, there's a pre-advising meeting that all first-year students must attend so they can better understand how to um, register for classes. The PACE program is one of the things that academic advisors also facilitate. And the PACE program is specific to first year students who find themselves on academic probation at the end of the first semester. And this requires students to meet with their academic advisors at least four times during the semester. And then some students may also choose to take that ID 101 class in place of meeting with their advisors four times a semester, they'll take that ID 101 class 
in place of that, but the PACE program is intended to help our students who are on probation recalibrate, understand what, what they may have done or may not have done that had them on probation and make that change. Our upper division advising model also use a very, uses a very similar um, plan with academic counseling and making appropriate referrals as needed. The one thing I want to highlight that both academic advisors do, as well as the retention office and a number of staff on campuses, uh, about the ninth week of the semester, students who are in 100 and 200 level classes um, receive, may receive midterm deficiencies. So if a student is um, getting C minus or below, a faculty will notify and say you have a midterm deficiency. That information is shared with academic advisors and the retention office, and then we do an intrusive outreach to those students to help get them connected to the appropriate resources before they get to the end of the semester. This um, falls into the intrusive interventions that we um, have employed. This fall, we will launch a student success um, solution that involves early alert and predictive analytics that will be adopted campus-wide. This will allow us to use some of the things that we, all the data we have, some of the measures and interventions that we already do to be able to target, identify and target the most at risk students at the right time and then intervene at the right time with them. So we're really excited about the opportunity to do that. Then we have resource referrals by faculty, staff, advisors, anyone who is um, in touch or uh, works with students knows to, re to refer them accordingly to all of the resources that we've mentioned. Um, in f prior to fall 2018, we used MapWorks um, for SkyFactor as our early alert, and MapWorks was a transition survey that students took about the first year students and transfer students took about the second week of the semester. And we used that to identify students who were not transitioning socially, academically, and then being able to intervene based on that information. So that's one of the things that we, we do from an intervention perspective. We spoke about midterm deficiency, sending notices and then interventions and outreach um, to that group and then the PACE academic pro program for students who are on academic probation. One of the questions the commission had was about, so, you know, when all of this, if this doesn't work, if all of these interventions and all of these things we have in place don't work, what, what is the process for students with regards to continued enrollment or withdrawal from the university? So largely, um, students not enrolling at Ball State is largely performance-based. Um, so students could do a voluntary withdrawal um, before a student withdraws from all their classes, they are required to meet with an individual staff person from our retention office who works with them, reviews their options, and talks about what are, what are they thinking with regards to returning. Do they plan to return? Is this a permanent decision? What are the things that went into making that decision? For students who say, I'm just taking a semester break, or I need a year break, or there's a family situation, I intend to come back, we have a list of those students, and if they say, I plan to return fall 2020, then in spring 2019 and summer, we will start reaching out to those students to say, you said you were coming back, what are you still planning to do so, and then help them transition back into the institution. For some of our students, um, they are, if they are, we give them SAP warning or debt warnings are one of the things that um, for our students we do. Um, if a student gets the SAP warning or um, they lose their aid as a result of that, they have the ability to appeal based on extenuating circumstances. And our staff in the retention office and financial aid are extremely helpful in working with students who want to appeal um, to appeal that. So that's one of the things that we offer to students. Um, we stu students are on academic probation, so students on their first semester who don't earn a 2.0 grade point average may be put on academic probation. And that gives them one more year to get their cumulative grade point average up to 
Um, and if they don't, then they are academically disqualified from the institution. Students who disqualified, again, have the um, ability to appeal based on extenuating circumstances. And again, our staff helps them do that. Once students um, are dismissed from the institution or choose to withdraw, um, they may be eligible to apply for re-enrollment as a returning student. There's no application fee associated with that, and they usually have a decision within just a few weeks. If a student attends another institution during this time, then we will ask them to um, provide a transcript as well. As well. One of the things that you asked is, what do we do for students who are leaving and whether we make referrals to Workforce Ready Grant or any of these programs? At this time, there is no intentional effort to say, if you are, then here is a referral to that program. I think what we have done philosophically is try to identify why the student is withdrawing and for them to consider re-enrollment once the circumstances have changed and how we help them transition back into the institution at some point. Um, so one of the things that is key to that for us is in fall 2019, we will launch a transfer center at the institution that will help us for students who may get academically disqualified and go to another institution to be able to come back in. But it will help us um, coordinate our efforts in getting students to transfer back to the institution. With regards to financial literacy, um, some of the things that we have done as an institution is even, th this is a huge issue across the nation, but for us, um, we recognize the responsibility we have to make sure that students and families are considering their financial obligations and the debt they may um, incur from attending an institution. So financial aid staff often go to high schools, um, pre-enrollment school visits to talk with students about financial aid and what that means. During summer orientation, the financial aid office offers one-on-one -on -one meetings with students and families throughout orientation to help them do that. Um, student, we make active, we make awards to students and they have to actively confirm that they are accepting those awards. So awards aren't automatically made. Students have to confirm that they want to accept loans or they want to accept um, the aid that we have provided. One of the things we have invested in is a third party um, eye intuition um, solution which provides tools for students to compare repayment options and be able to talk with counselors about their repayment options when they leave as it relates to their loans. Then every student at Ball State is required to take a finance 101 class, which is a personal finance or fiscal wellness course for all students. And during that course, students talk a lot about finances and debt and how that affects um, their future. And that is one of the things that we're really excited about, the opportunity to offer that to students. And then, of course, our financial aid um, office monitors all debt levels, debt levels for all students, trying to pay close attention to students may, who may be incurring significant debt and not making the academic progress that they need to make. Because obviously, we are conscious of not allowing students to take on debt and not make progress to be able to continue. So this is our brief presentation um, on on what we do um, with regards to students who may um, have at-risk indicators at Ball State, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. I, I, I just have one question around debt. That is, do, do our institutions have access to all of the debt that um, a student may uh, get from different, from different sources. In As, other words, mm -hmm. um, the, you, you can rack up debt from multiple sources. Does mm -hmm. the university have some insight into all of that? I th we have insight from the financial aid perspective into debt that they may incur 
as student loans. So any student loan, whether it's a private loan or a federal loan, yes. But outside of student loans, no, the institution unfortunately does not have the ability to see the breadth of student debt. Are they incurring student loans? Do they have personal loans, car loans? So we don't unfortunately get to have as clear a picture um, with regards to that. It's only in conversations with students about what is happening financially that um, financial aid staff or other staff may be aware of that. I, I, my follow-up question to that is, uh, I hear anecdotally, mm -hmm. I don't have any personal knowledge of this, but students uh, uh, can gather loans from different loan sources and only a portion of it actually goes to the institution. They may yes. use it for other purposes. Yes. Living, so, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, that's where they, where yes. they get into trouble. Yeah. Um, when universities report student debt, is the debt that's reported all of those student loans, regardless of whether they went to the university for a course uh, or, 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 or fees or things associated with the university, and, uh, and not uh, personal use? They would be able to report any loans that will apply to the student's university debt. So um, if it went to tuition or fees, but if a student incurred a loan and that didn't necessarily go to their fees, um, it, would, it could show up as a loan on their financial aid package in that if they were eligible for that loan through the package and they took it, then it would show up. If a student takes a private loan outside of that, I'm not sure if it necessarily shows up as part of that financial aid package, but it's something that we, I certainly will ask about. I'm not certain that it does show up as part of that. Yeah. But I get, I get what you are saying. If a student takes a loan and then, let's say, buy a motor vehicle um, and it does not go to tu tuition and fees, how does financial aid know the student took a $5,000 loan outside of the cost of attendance that the institution has put forward? Yeah, I guess that's what goes yes. through my mind. Yes. Is it a, it's, if the, if our, uh, our partner, university partners, are, are reporting student loan debt, Yes. Yes. Certainly. Yeah. Um, you have the unfortunate disadvantage of going first. Yes. <laughs> um, about how many advisor or uh, students per advisor do you have? Do you um, have a ratio you shoot for? I th I believe for our first year advisors, I think it's one to, and I'm going to look up cash. One to 320, thank you, Kesha, Dr. McBride. One to 320 for our first year students. What about, what about post first year? It's about the same. Okay. We just, we just moved to a professional advising model for our upper division students as well. discover that college isn't right for them right now, even if they're very conscientious, or that perhaps college isn't right, the traditional college isn't right for them long term. And so there's going to be, it's a given that they're going to be dropouts, that mm -hmm. kids who either choose to drop out or are forced to, to leave. And by the way, let me just, and I don't want to take up so much time, but I thought your presentation in terms of your the efforts of Ball State to try to keep kids in, inform them when they're not doing well, uh, et cetera, is uh, laudable. What, what worries me is we've got these kids that are, are not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And yet, so they go to these colleges, they come from low-income families, and they have, uh, and they end up with high debt, yes. no degrees, and so they're worse off than if they'd never gone to college. And so my concern is 
what are we doing to identify those kids as quickly as possible? If it's not right for them, helping them transition out to have as low a debt as possible. I think we should be measuring how much debt our, our dropouts have and work hard to try to minimize that and then counsel them uh, with respect to what, what their next step should be. And that, that's why we had the question in there Absolutely. about workforce ready grants because some people find out that you know, they, they don't want an academic, uh, what's traditionally mm -hmm. thought of as an academic degree, they would prefer to have an uh, industrial certification or something along those lines. So, uh, I, and I don't know that there's any answer. I'm, I'm a, I, I would appreciate if those of you who are presenting today would, would, would address that because I think that it's, we're, we're, we are, it's, it's a disservice to these kids who are gonna drop out to prolong the amount of time they're in school which just increases the amount of debt they have, and and then it makes their 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 lives much more difficult than they would have been otherwise. So how do you yes. get them out sooner as opposed to later? Because your whole thrust is to try to keep them in as long as possible. And by the way, I, 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 Teresa's going to be mad at me for keeping <laughs> on talking, but there's y'all have an incentive to keep them in as long as possible because that's you get money. You know, we, we're all motivated by money, and and. You get more tuition uh, money the longer they stay in, even though you know it's 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 a dis. And I'm not suggesting there's there's um, that you're doing this intentionally, yeah. but but just as a byproduct, you want to keep them in as long as possible. It benefits the the university financially, but it hurts them financially. So. What are you doing so to get them out sooner rather than later? So That's I'm going to question. give you a really quick response to this. And certainly, I'm, you're welcome. I'm be willing to answer more in depth, but in light of other people waiting to present. Um, so one of the things, when I spoke about the fact that students don't withdraw without having a conversation, although we cannot statistically say we've referred these many students to, to workforce grant or to this, we, this, this is what we do. We talk to students about their plans moving forward, their intention to come back. If they don't come back, what does that mean for them? Do they understand um, the debt that they have incurred and what that means payment-wise in six months? Those are the conversations we have to help students understand that responsibility and that, that burden, because it is. On the other hand, when we, yes, we try to retain students as long as possible, but I think for us it is realistic that every student who is admitted to Ball State will not graduate from Ball State. So it is our philosophy of how do we best position the student to be successful after Ball State, whatever they choose to do. And I think more and more we're seeing students take gap years, gap semesters. I think this, this year has really been telling for us on students who've come to us to just say, I don't know if that is for me. So we help them figure out what may be for them and always leave the option open to come back to Ball State, but that they choose to do something else, whatever that is, in a productive way, even if it's not Ball State. But um, with regards to statistics, I think it's one of the things that institutions, and maybe there are other institutions who do it better, and we'll hear about best practices, but I think it's one of those things that we can certainly track as we go through the withdrawal or drop or, um, dropout process for our students and how we engage them after that or prepare them for that. I would hope Thank all you. the universities would, would actually report to us how much debt the, the dropouts have uh, because the, the goal should be to minimize that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thorough presentation. We're going to take just a moment and I hope John will cost us back up again. And while we're doing that, um, uh, Dr. Michael Carr, the provost and vice president for Indiana State, is going to come up and be prepared to present, present next. Thank you. And uh, thank you to my colleague from Ball State for blazing the trail. <laughs> I was taking notes furiously. Um, Yep. No, that's fine. By the way, we were supplied information about the the uh, attrition rates at Ball State. It shows after one year it's twelve percent, and then uh, after eight years it's twenty percent. At Indiana State, it shows I can find Indiana State. There it is. Twenty-four percent after year one, and uh, long term, I write at forty percent. Um, 
So the question, uh, I'm sorry to get so involved, but the question is, how, how are you dealing with it? I mean, 25% of your freshman class is dropping right. out. And uh, if, yep. I, I, are they being treated as well as they possibly can? And I will, uh, I will address that. I was scribbling some notes in, uh, to add into my presentation. So as, we as certainly want to give you the opportunity to answer the other questions, too. But clearly, absolutely. this, is a, this yeah. line of questioning is going to be No, part and, of it's, all and of it's very questions. important for us. Sure. We're taking it very seriously on our campus. Uh, and in fact, I'm deeply engaged in efforts uh, uh, at our institution to uh, address that very question that you asked. OK, I'll just start. And uh, colleagues can join us on the phone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the kinds of things that we're doing uh, at Indiana State University to uh, support our students uh, as, they, uh, as they work towards uh, their degree. Um, I think it's important for the commission to be reminded about uh, our student body because this is a topic that is particularly important for us and I think it, it feeds into some of the uh, additional challenges that uh, our students face. You know, about 55% of our incoming freshman class each year is Pell eligible uh, and that's a very, very high number. Um, that is literally what the commission defines as at risk for its performance budgeting uh, purposes. So. More than half of our uh, student body is, uh, is at risk, uh, according to that indicator. Half of our incoming freshmen and about half the student body is uh, first generation college going. Uh, and so they don't come in with the background, the familial knowledge uh, that uh, is so helpful uh, as students navigate what is really a complica complex bureaucracy. Uh, and about a little bit more than a fifth of our uh, students uh, are 21st century scholars. And so you know, we have a, a mix of students uh, on our campus that uh, come to us with uh, some difficulties you know, right, right out of the gate. So given our student population uh, at ISU, we are doing a lot uh, of hands-on, intrusive uh, kinds of advising uh, and other support in order to help uh, our students best we can. Um, I would also like to say uh, in, in regards to uh, uh, the, uh, the chair's uh, uh, concerns about sharing best practices, you know, over the last uh, several years, we've hosted an annual student success conference. Many uh, colleagues from all of the universities around the state have attended. We do this free of charge for anybody who wants to, uh, who wants to show up. And it literally is designed to spend a day kind of bouncing ideas off of each other uh, to, uh, to identify solutions for, uh, for some of these problems and challenges that, that we all face uh, in, in the state. Um, one thing that uh, our data show that all of the statistical analysis that we run uh, on, on our students and their likelihood of being successful uh, is that you know incoming attributes uh, from from high school you know the the traditional things that we all think about test scores and high school GPA particularly uh, interface pretty importantly with uh, that first uh, first semester performance uh, those two things those incoming attributes and how they're doing right out of the gate at, at Indiana State University those are the two things that really go on to predict uh, how well our students are going to are going to do. So we've been thinking a lot about how to make sure our students are, are more likely to get get off to a good start. Um, some of this starts with uh, those questions about how we've identified or are admitting uh, conditionally admitted students. Uh, past practice was um, uh, was simply to identify a high school GPA band uh, that, uh, that was um, uh, such that if you were going to be admitted to Indiana State University, you were going to be admitted conditionally. We have now switched to a new, what I think is more rigorous, and this is um, part of our new approach to addressing some of the concerns that, uh, that, that you've raised. Um, to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about students uh, the, uh, around their motivation to be successful. So we have them respond to a series of questions, essay questions, uh, about their motivation uh, to be a successful college student, what their definition of success is and how they're going to achieve it. 
uh, what their commitment is to the mission of, and vision of the university. We are known for our community engagement and service learning, and so uh, if you are not going to be committed to those kinds of things at Indiana State University, you're not going to fit in very well. Uh, and then how a student uh, is thinking about uh, interfacing with us in terms of accessing and taking advantage of all of the resources that we that we provide. We want to know those things up front before we're going to conditionally admit a student now. Uh, then getting more specifically to your to some of your concerns uh, about um, students who are admitted to, to college and then drop out after a, after a short period of time. Um, Right now, I'm in the process of leading the overhaul or actually development of our strategic enrollment management plan for, for Indiana State University, and we've taken the approach that, frankly, we'd rather not admit those students in the first place if they're not going to be successful. So part of our strategic enrollment management plan actually involves building strong partnerships, particularly with our local Ivy Tech campus, uh, but you know, we'd be happy to partner with the, with the entire system to jointly kind of make a determination to see if it would be better for a student to start uh, at, at Ivy Tech. Uh, we will dual admit them. They can you know, wear t-shirts that say Ivy Tech and Indiana State, whatever. Uh, they can access our resources. We'll treat them as one of our students, but we, we will help them launch uh, their, their uh, college career in a way for them uh, so that they'll be much more likely to be successful. Uh, that should save uh, them time, money, uh, and put them more securely on a, on a path to success. So this is something that is, um, you know, as you say, perhaps, you know, there's there some short-term costs for the university, but long-term, this is the right thing to do ethically. Uh, it's the right thing to do long-term for our student body anyway. We'll get those students. You know, we'll, we'll continue to work with them. They will be Indiana State University students, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, start in maybe a different, a, a different way. So that's uh, one example of uh, how we're thinking about kind of overhauling the, um, uh, the, the admission experience and first uh, semester or first year experience for, you know, for some of our students. So thank you for that question. That fits in perfectly with uh, the very work that we're doing right now at ISU. There we go. Um, you know, that said, we want to make sure all of our students get off to a good start. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, that first semester particularly, and really the first year, is so critical. So we roll a lot of effort into that, into that freshman year. Uh, but we make sure that uh, there are resources and support monitoring and tracking proactive advising throughout a, a college student's experience at, at Indiana State. Um, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the tools that we use, uh, quite frankly, are, are best practices that are imported from C Complete College America or something like that, where, you know, we, we roll a lot of advising efforts into uh, the 15 to finish uh, programs. Uh, we have uh, curricular pathways that are well defined uh, for our students uh, and uh, in, in line with some of the new uh, information and initiatives coming out of CCA is uh, linked again to will students have a good understanding of what they're getting into, uh, trying to push that information out to prospective students about what uh, career pathways lie at the, at the end of a particular major, what the expectations of a degree program might be so that they can start to make some good choices rather than piling into Indiana State University because they always wanted to be a nurse but they don't have the academic credentials to get into the nursing program. Uh, we want to make sure that students don't you know, come into college, pile up against some gateway that they're never going to be able to get through. We want to make sure that we front end as much of that uh, information as possible. Uh, we have a newly developed student risk tool uh, that, we, uh, that we have put into place this year. Like uh, my colleague at Ball State, we used to use uh, MapWorks, and that was a good tool, um, but it is really uh, for transitioning students, new, brand new students coming in or transfer students. Didn't really have many uh, applications beyond that, uh, that, that, those very first few weeks. Uh, and so we've transitioned to a new tool that actually uh, tracks and reports a set of risk factors for every single student on campus. 
Uh, those risk factors are those pre-existing factors that they bring to us, like high school GPA and their financial situation. Um, and there's, there's breakdowns within each one of these categories. Uh, plus then a set of observed or ongoing risk factors that, uh, that, that they might encounter while a student at ISU. Uh, so the number of times and frequency of uh, dropping classes, uh, whether or not they're enrolled in less than you know, 15 hours, that's a risk factor. Uh, excess credits beyond the degree requirements, cumulative and term ISU GPAs, the number of F grades they have, uh, student conduct holds, financial pressures and things like that. So we get a good holistic picture of every single student. Most students at ISU are fine. They don't really fall. They don't really show up in, on these risk factors. Um, uh, but we do track every student. Um, and uh, then that's available and pushed out to our academic advisors. Uh, and you can sort out, you can log into this and you sort out. And if you're advisor X, you just drop, pull down your name and there's your set of advisees and where exactly they show up on, on, all of these, uh, on all of these risk factors. So that we can know how to tailor advice, uh, steer students to the appropriate resources on campus, uh, this allows us to be much more precise in, in how we advise students on the particular challenges that they might be facing. Some students might be facing academic challenges, some might be facing other kinds of challenges and they need different kinds of resources. We need to know that. This tool helps us with that. It also um, allows us to be a lot more efficient with how we deploy student success resources. Rather than trying to blanket campus with one resource that only some need, uh, we, can, we can be a lot more targeted uh, in our approach. Um, we also, for upperclassmen, particularly juniors and seniors, uh, we deploy a set of professional advisors in each college, um, uh, including a set of completion specialists, uh, we call them. Uh, those are staff members who essentially take uh, all of the juniors and seniors in their particular college and ensure that they understand what their path towards degree completion is, right? So uh, particularly this is important for you know, those who are juniors because they've got some time left to make some adjustments if they're going to need to uh, make sure that they get enrolled in a particular class uh, or make sure that they're able to complete successfully a class they're in right now because it's a prerequisite for a class that they're going to need in their senior year. So that, I think, has helped a lot. We've, uh, we started this a, a couple of years ago, and we've already seen some, uh, some, some good results from, uh, from this particular initiative. Getting back to, uh, getting back to the freshmen, as I mentioned, uh, getting them off to a good start. We know statistically all of our probability models show that that first year is so important. Uh, we do, uh, like Ball State, uh, use a, a centralized approach for, for freshmen. We advise and support all of our freshmen out of the university college. Um, and all of the professional advisors in the university college use a, what we call a case management approach. Uh, essentially as if they were social workers, but they're academic advisors and college support workers uh, to uh, triangulate all of the support uh, that we have on campus uh, to ensure that uh, our students are supported as best uh, as they can be. It's a very high-touch, intrusive approach. Uh, uh, they're meeting, in some cases, weekly with their students. Um, and uh, it involves uh, a lot of uh, uh, cross-training and connections and interface with other portions of campus. So there's constant contact with uh, the Division of Student Affairs uh, and uh, the Financial Aid Office. Um, the final thing I'll mention on this slide is that project success program. Uh, we do not have a bridge program that's deployed in the middle of the summer. We used to, but we found that our students, since they're coming to us, you know, more, if you recall, more than half are Pell eligible, they just can't afford to, you know, take a, a three weeks or two weeks in the middle of the summer and move to Terre Haute, be on campus for a while, and then move back home. It's very disruptive for, for our student population. So what we've done is we've moved that program from the middle of the summer to 
uh, the time period before the fall semester starts. That way they get to move in early and they get to be in their dorm room that they're going to be in anyway. So they get to come to campus, um, you know, about 10 days early uh, and uh, join this program called Project Success. Uh, and what this does is it allows them to move in early so they get the feel of, of campus. They are in a living learning community, for, uh, guaranteed. Uh, we do have a lot of other living learning communities that are optional for students, uh, but they have a, a dedicated one. There is a set of cohort-based first-year classes so that the same set of students kind of works through their, their sets of classes all together in that first year. So they develop that bond, they've got some friends, familiar faces in, the, uh, in, in their classes. There is a first year transition course to help them uh, in that first fall semester navigate the bureaucracy of Indiana State University and make those adjustments from high school and home to college and campus. Um, they're connected with peer mentors, upper class, usually honors college students uh, that, uh, that, that will help them with their courseworks and other, other kinds of adjustments to college. And then a set of mandatory structured study and homework times uh, so that we can ensure that they're uh, spending the time that they need out of the classroom in order to be successful in the classroom. Uh, to, to talk a little bit more about the questions regarding uh, academic uh, dismissal and probation, um, we uh, are one of the few college campuses that uh, will go ahead and dismiss a student for poor academic performance right away. Um, that if you've dug up, yeah, it, and that's our, that's our philosophy that if you've dug a deep hole for yourself in the fall semester, there's really no chance that uh, you're going to get out of that hole and, and we recommend that you put the shovel down uh, and, uh, and, and go and do something else. Um, so that's a little bit of, you know, a lot of university, uh, they, they don't like that. It's tough love approach essentially, but um, you, know, that, uh, uh, you know, that threshold is awfully low and it maybe could be slightly higher, but uh, we, we use that threshold. Uh, and if you've not cleared that, uh, you, are, you are dismissed from, uh, from Indiana State uh, right after your fall, uh, fall semester. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty low GPA. Um, the, uh, um, uh, for, for students who are ongoing, who uh, might be on the verge of uh, being put on academic probation, or being, uh, if they are on academic probation and are perhaps on the verge of being dismissed, uh, we take that very seriously. And so any kind of risk factor that pops up in that system that I talked about that, we, that we've developed, if those pop up, if uh, interim grades pop up uh, that, uh, that are, that are going to put you on a path to probation or, or dismissal or any of those other risk factors kick you into the moderate or high category, that triggers uh, uh, outreach uh, from, from our support staff and academic advisors on campus. Um, and then again, to make reference to uh, our, our partnerships with, uh, with Ivy Tech, we try to make sure that students uh, you know, have, a, have a, still a pathway to some degree completion or some credential that they can still earn if they've been dismissed academically from, from Indiana State. If they also have an interest in returning to ISU after they've been dismissed um, and have sat out for uh, the, the, uh, the, the requisite amount of time, we do try to put them on a path to take classes at Ivy Tech so that they don't get behind in time towards their degree uh, and are still able to uh, complete some college classes, but then also hopefully try to figure out uh, what, uh, uh, what they're interested in, what they would like to do, maybe take some time to evaluate themselves uh, and, uh, and, and how they've uh, performed uh, at Indiana State while they're, while they're on dismissal and if they are taking classes particularly at, uh, at Ivy Tech, we stay in, in close contact with them throughout, throughout that time period to continue to advise them. So although we've dismissed them, we, we, don't, uh, we still treat them as, uh, as one of our students. Uh, and then to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, con concerns regarding financial literacy, um, you know, given that our student body, more than half of it is, uh, is low income and half are first generation, there's just a lot of complexities to financial aid that, that uh, there, 
that our students and their families oftentimes don't understand. So it's very important for us to be uh, uh, more transparent about the full cost of attendance uh, and how uh, the student and their families are going to be able to, to pay for all of that. Um, you know, we do have a large number of students um, who leave Indiana State University in good academic standing, but with a bill that they, that they are struggling to pay and can't register for the next semester because their bill is too high. So it gets back to your initial question of, you know, we, we want to front end as much as this is possible so that the student and their family knows for sure that they're going to be able to pay for this so that they don't get into their junior year and then, you know, run out of money. Um, so we want to be more transparent up front. We do have dedicated staff resources in our financial aid office designed to do financial aid counseling, financial literacy. The goal there is to encourage all of our students to live like students, um, to, <laughs> to borrow what they need, the minimum what they need to pay their tuition, their fees, their books, and a reasonable amount for room and board, right? So that they're not borrowing past that so that they can also have the latest iPhone, a decent car, and all those other kinds of things, and you know, going out for, for, uh, for, for dinner and things like that. We want to make sure that we counsel them so that they borrow, so that they live like a student, um, so they don't incur debt beyond really what is truly needed to attend uh, Indiana State. Um, and we do a lot of that uh, personal financial aid counseling um, uh, 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 over the phone and in person as applicants consider uh, enrolling at Indiana State. Once they do show up for orientation, we hit them again. Uh, and then that uh, financial aid counseling continues. As I said, we've dedicated staff resources for this. So anytime while a student is engaged with us, they can, they can seek out that information. Their parents come to campus a lot too. And then we spend a lot of uh, time and effort to make sure that as many people on, on campus are cross-trained to the extent possible um, uh, on this issue so that uh, when you have a student sitting in your office and they're you're starting to realize that they've got some financial pressures, that you can spot those things uh, and, you can, and you can know how to get them uh, to the right resources on campus uh, quickly. So we try to build that network of support around our students um, on this issue. You know, so there's a lot that we're doing. Um, I'm very proud of our efforts. Uh, I think uh, the new things that we've identified and uh, some of the new strategies going forward will, will help our, particularly our at-risk and low-income students even more. Um, that said, we have been successful. You know, our on-time graduation rate for all of our undergraduates over the last four years is up 10 percentage points. So we're headed in the right direction. The things that we're doing are working. Thanks. I think you've answered a lot of the questions that might occur at the end. We want to give just a, a couple minutes for uh, members of the commission if you have questions. The ratio. What's the ratio of uh, counselors to students? The uh, the the ratio of uh, advisors to advisors, to students. Yeah. It's about the same as uh, as Ball State's Three, is. It's about three hundred or so to. Okay. Per student, and then in the upper, I, I will say though, at the upper levels, um, uh, you know, a lot. There's a lot of variation in how advising is done across uh, our, our colleges. Uh, some have uh, heftier amounts of uh, professional advising. Others um, will uh, identify faculty or staff in a department to give release time or dedicate some of their job responsibilities to advising. So. I don't know if I have at the tip of my tongue a, a precise ratio for upperclassmen uh, at, on, on campus. Thank you. We appreciate very much um, all the information that you've provided. You. There may be some follow-up questions, but it, we'll, we know where to find you. Yes, you do. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to move to Indiana University with Rebecca Torstrick, who's the Senior Assistant Vice President of University Academic Affairs. Director, Completion, and Student Success Office. Um, and I understand that we will be addressing both all, all of the campuses collectively, uh, but there may be some specific questions about regional campuses versus the main campus as well. And I would say, and I offer this to everyone, 
keep in mind that members of the commission have seen the answers to the questions, so I think it's important that especially you, you spend your time explaining those things that they may not be able to understand just by reading them on their own, but things that are obvious we keep moving, uh, moving us along. Thank you. So I'm not able to advance, all right. Pardon me while I learn the technology here. Um, so I'm not going to be going in as much detail about individual specific programs because if I covered things on all seven of our campuses, we would be here for quite a bit longer. So what I'm going to try to share with you is the overall philosophy and thinking about working with students at, Indi at Indiana University. And then I've, I've tried to pick out some of the um, key efforts that um, help to answer some of the questions that you've asked us. So um, we do have admission of, of conditional, conditional admission at some of our campuses except IU Bloomington. Um, it is a combination of test scores and high school GPA. Students may be required to participate in a summer bridge that focuses then on helping them learn some of the key um, writing, math skills, study skills that will help them be successful as they move into a full academic year. And they may also be required to take a success course that also reinforces that or to meet with an advisor who's going to pay special attention to their particular needs for that first semester. Um, the marker is retained for the in, their entire academic career because it is, a, it is an admissions marker and it does allow advisors moving forward to be able to keep track of what's happening with students and make sure that they're still on track. Um, we also have a program for um, students who fall below those conditional admission standards where we work with our partner Ivy Tech. Um, students are encouraged to go to Ivy Tech to work on earning their associate's degree and then um, we monitor them. So the ABC program at South Bend, Kokomo and Northwest, we monitor them while they're at Ivy Tech working with partners there, keep track of them, invite them back to campus for special opportunities. And then once they earn their associate's degree at Ivy Tech, they can then get back into a program through a TSAP, right, at Indiana University, which then allows them to um, um, earn their degree in another two years. And there are some financial benefits for the students, so there's some um, tuition assistance provided for them for being part of this program. We also have passport or pathways programs similar to this at other institutions as well, at IU East and at IUPUI. Um, in terms of, of pr um, providing uh, support for students, this slide is a composite of different kinds of student support efforts that occur on all of our campuses. Um, one thing I want to be really clear about to help address some of the questions that you've raised so far is that at Indiana University, we believe it is a moral imperative that if we accept students and give them admission to our institution, we do everything in our power to make sure that they are able to leave us with a degree what we absolutely don't want is what you uh, raised as an issue, that they leave us um, having failed and having ended up with high debt. So we've been working very hard to try to make sure that um, we reduce the possibility of that happening. So if, if, they're, if they're admitted, they have to be supported. Um, and I, I know that. And I'm, We agree with you. We agree with you. And I'm going to share with you some of the efforts that those other campuses have been taking to try to change that statistic that you just raised. Um, so what um, we're doing first year experiences, we've got support, student support services, tutoring, peer mentoring, specialized writing and math support, study skills workshops, advising support, career counseling support. We also offer summer bridges. We offer specialized advising and mentoring support. So student success coaching has been embedded now in many of our campuses, our regional campuses. And so there are a lot of different support activities that are there for students. However, one of the things that we know is that the students who are under-resourced are often the students who are least likely to seek out those supports. And so um, part of what we're having to change is the uh, way in which, it, instead of expecting the student to come to the support, um, we're really working right now to try to make sure we get the support to the student. And um, I use regionals, just spent three years working with um, ASCU, the national um, 
Higher Ed Association in a project to reimagine the first year. And part of that, as part of that project, they took a look at policies that are on the campuses to ensure that they are student friendly and um, appropriate. They um, really strongly looked at the data and are trying to build a culture of data informed practice. Um, a lot of communication with students was rewritten um, in order to make it clear and supportive. So instead of getting a legal um, letter that uh, lets you know you're on probation and makes it sound like you're going to jail, um, probation letters were rewritten right across all of the campuses to um, let students know that it's, it's, it, it's, it's not, everyone has bad semesters. People have bad semesters sometimes and that it is possible to come back from that so that, it, that that's a challenge but it's a challenge that we believe you can overcome and we're here to help support you in doing that. Um, they also did a lot of faculty and staff training. Um, there were uh, pedagogical innovations that happened so courses were reimagined. Um, new pedagogy was built in to make them more active learning, more experiential learning and a really significant emphasis on non-cognitive skills. So paying attention to developing students' sense of belongingness on the campus and um, developing growth mindset because we know from the national research that both of these factors are really important in terms of student success. And the thing about this is that the campuses work together on this. So we're trying to build a culture of collaboration among our regional campuses where they're working together, they're sharing. So some of what you're asking us to do is share the success stories, share the things that are working, and, and do a better job of scaling up. So this is part of what we tried to do through this um, reimagining the first year. It's a three-year effort. They, um, have, they are continuing it on their own. So they continue to meet, to share um, strategies, um, projects, um, innovations that worked on a campus. They'll share them with other campuses, sharing materials. And so this, I think, is a, it's a really important effort, but it's going to take time because you don't um, completely turn all of these things around in a single year. And these are some of the metrics that we look at to measure success. So it really is all about the student outcomes. So um, are they accumulating uh, enough credits in the first year? Are they passing their courses? Are they having success in gateway courses? Gateway courses were often redesigned in order to reduce DFW rates, um, especially math. Um, student performance in later courses. So they, they do well here. Are they doing, still doing well later? Um, are they persisting to the second year, declaring majors, and are they graduating on time? Um, one thing that I hope you did notice is that our on-time graduation rates at our regional campuses have in fact been increasing. Um, in terms of advising, um, we've got sort of two strategies here. One is that um, we risk, we, we avoid using the label at risk for our students because we believe that when you label someone as at risk, you begin to create a self, potentially a self-fulfilling um, outcome, that a student labeled at risk will be treated differently and um, may not be um, challenged to excel at quite the same level. So rather than labeling students as at risk, we um, encourage advisors to keep track of their advisees. Um, it's a little vague, but we give them a lot of, in the advising record system, they have a lot of um, variables that they can use to track different student populations. We encourage them to do proactive outreach to those populations, keep track of the students, call them in, have them come in for advising, and as part of the advising experience, we've been developing um, coaching and life skills um, for all of our advisors at IU. Um, this is an IU program where we're, we've so far reached 300 um, advisors, student support staff, and even some faculty at our campuses to train them in the skills of life coaching. Um, it's embedded within the advising encounter. Um, it allows the advisor to um, work with the student in a way that allows the student to take greater ownership over solving their own problems because this is part of what we need them to be able to do is to work through for themselves um, how to be successful. And um, we're about to graduate our first class of 11 trainers who will allow us to take this, this program even deeper into all of our campuses. So um, we're very proud of this particular initiative. 
Um, we also have an early alert process that we've developed um, at IU. Um, it's system-wide. It's uh, focused around engagement. So we believe that we're not focused on performance. We're focusing on engagement. Faculty can't um, affect how students um, necessarily perform in class, but they can affect how engaged the student is in the class. And if a student is engaged, they'll perform better. So the um, student engagement roster is a tool um, that allows faculty to um, provide feedback about how students are doing, both positive and negative. And they can provide um, comments, notes to students, letting them know how they're doing, making suggestions for where to go. Faculty were already doing this, but they do it in a context where they know they're doing it with the student, but no one else knows it. And so this data is available to advisors. Um, the students can see that the faculty member, um, um, students know that faculty have provided this feedback, but they can also see if their advisors looked at it. Uh, faculty can see if students and advisors have looked at it. So there's a lot of transparency here in terms of everyone knowing that everyone else knows this is happening. Um, and um, when students are um, told to get engaged in other areas of the university, like look at the honors program, get involved in clubs, there's the opportunity for people working with those programs to now do proactive outreach to the students instead of us waiting to see if the student will follow through. So um, we're just, we just launched this this last this academic year. It's active beginning the first, of the first day of the semester. We encourage faculty, if students are not attending during the first week, to let us know so that we can work with them, make sure they don't end up with um, debt when they forgot they had registered for classes and now have moved three states away. Um, and so as a result, this is helping us keep better track of students and intervene to try to prevent um, failure. Before, you never knew how students were doing until the end of the semester when the grades came in. This is an effort to try to get some warning in advance that things may not be going well and reach out to and help students. Um, in terms of probation and dismissal, we've had a lot of discussion about this. Um, probation occurs in stages, so there's a low impact probation, a high impact, and then academic dismissal. Um, when a student's cumulative GPA falls below 2.0, that puts them on a low impact um, probation. They have one semester in order to raise their GPA back up above two um, in order to stay enrolled. If they um, have a subsequent term where their GPA um, um, is below a 2.0, that can end up leading to academic dismissal. Um, the supports for students that are on probation include special probation programs, intensive advising, so advisors who only work with probation students, contracts, success coaches, reduced course loads, peer mentoring, study skills workshops. Um, students who end up being academically dismissed do have the opportunity to be reinstated. We generally ask that they sit out a semester or two in order to give them time to figure out what was not working, and then um, they can petition to be reinstated. Um, we've not been letting students know about the Workforce Ready grants, but we're going to, um, we're going to change that. So I'm going to make sure that all of our advisors um, are trained on the availability of the Workforce Ready grants, and that they're encouraged to use, um, to point students towards that as an opportunity when a student needs to stop out or has decided that the path that they're on is not the right path, and to make sure that they know about the availability of those and to encourage them to pursue them and follow through on them. Um, we really want what's best for the student. Um, we take debt very seriously at IU. And so um, one of the tools that we have is our Money Smarts program. Um, this it, um, Money Smarts um, provides one-on-one um, -on -one counseling for students. There's a series of um, podcasts, lessons. Students can meet with a counselor, um, a peer mentor student counselor on their campus. Um, there are personal finance classes offered. Um, as part of this, Money Smarts developed a financial literacy training course for students. Uh, we used to use a canned tool that we purchased from a vendor, and we've actually built our own. Um, 
and um, students can go through it based on either their situation or on their status. So there are different lessons depending on the student's year in college. So the materials that are presented to a freshman are not the same as the materials presented to a senior. Um, the university has also worked on an annual debt letter. We've revised our financial aid award notices, shopping sheet. We've provided um, e-text, electronic text options, working with publishers to get the cost of textbooks reduced, um, in some cases as much as 50%, so that uh, we reduce the book expenses for students. There are options to deny loans. We have new financial calculators. And there's more financial aid information provided to students at orientation. Um, the work we've done on financial literacy has paid off because we've seen that over time students at Indiana University have greatly reduced the, the amount they're taking out in loans. Um, and then the question about do we know about loans. So we know all of the loan information. I mean, we know the loans that we've given students and we know the loans that other educational institutions have given students. And um, what we don't know is if a student has gone to a bank and taken out a private loan. That we can't track. Um, and if a student, um, we know what a student gets in terms of the amount that was used to, to cover any tuition and fees that comes out of a loan check. We know what we've um, issued to the student as a refund. So you were asking about whether or not we could track that. And I think the answer is yes, we have the information. Um, Students are usually not, I mean, there are, there are federal limits on how much a student can borrow, and um, always we look at what a student's need is and, and whether or not um, it looks like they're um, just borrowing for borrowing's sake. We, we try to really reduce the amount of loan, um, that student, the debt that students get into, because we do realize that's a really serious problem. And I'll take questions. John's deferring to me on this one. Advise ease per advisor. Um, we try to stick to the. I mean, ideally, we'd like to be at the Nakata. Nakata is the is, national. Isn't, yeah, isn't Nakata about four hundred that they recommend? No, no, no. It's one to two fifty. Oh. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we necessarily though make it to that. I think we probably have some units where it's more like one to three hundred. And um, if it's a really small program, it's possible that the load is even higher than that. Okay. But, but ideally, we are trying to make sure that um, students um, can get in to see advisors on a regular basis. Is your program administered centrally, or is it across all the uh, satellite campuses? Which program? Well, uh, essentially, the, you're kind of, many of the support programs that you've identified and, and addressing those students that are admitted conditionally? Right, so those are all done, um, those are all done campus by campus. Um, so the role that my office plays is to make sure that um, where possible we try to set the baseline of what it means to do this at Indiana University. Um, we try to make um, campuses and programs to work with them to make them aware of um, uh, the, the latest research and, um, and, and best practices. Um, we often work to develop, um, so we do a lot of training, we do a lot of, um, so the coach training is coming out of, out of completion and student success, supporting that. Um, we also developed Canvas-based new advisor training so that we, for the first time, have consistent training of new advisors across the university. And we also put our advising directors through um, an advising leadership institute that we developed with our organizational development staff to make sure that we've got the right um, we see advising needing to change, right? It's, it's a model that has to change. Advisors have to be more proactive and they have to play a different role. And so we wanted to make sure that our advising leaders were prepared for guiding that change. Thank you, Becky. We appreciate very much your presentation. Thank you. Oh, we'll and by the way, thank you for letting us talk about how we care about our students today. Uh, we move on next to Ivy Tech, uh, Dr. Corey Klossman ryan System Vice President for Student Success. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. There we go. Um, so as an open access institution, we're very aware that many of our students come in with risk factors that would place them um, 
um, at risk of not completing or graduating from Ivy Tech. Um, so I know many of you have seen these stats before, but we're 68% part-time. Um, we have an average age of 27. For part-time students, that's 28. 50% um, um, Pell eligible and 24% of our students have dependents as well. So we know that there are extra supports that we need to provide to our students. Um, and only 8% of them come in at the first time full time in the fall. So that's what you'd see figured into an IPEDS graduation rate, that 150% graduation rate as well. Um, so one of the things we know we need to do is provide special supports um, to a lot of these students because we, we know that they do have um, a, a background that um, could be working against them or some barriers for them as well. So we have some um, so we have some interventions just to support these students, but know that a lot of them are really there to support all of our students as well. <coughs> uh, about a year and a half ago, we went through a campus restructure process. As part of that, we created a new cabinet level position at each of the 19 campuses, a vice chancellor for student success position. Um, so it split out um, what, it, what we call student success from the enrollment function so that we could have a dedicated office and a dedicated person on each campus really to provide those supports for students. Um, so in addition to advising and student life, um, it also supports um, coaching and, and mentoring and wraparound services and, and some of those other supports um, to these students as well. Um, obviously we have academic support services uh, including tutoring and writing labs. Um, we do have a contract with tutor.com um, to provide online tutoring um, to our students because we know a lot of them, they can't come into an office between nine and five um, during the day and they do their work at, in, at night after their students go to bed, for example. And so it's at 10, 11 o'clock at night when they actually need that support. Um, so finding ways to support students when they need it, not necessarily when we're open as well. Um, wraparound services, our student government association presidents two years ago um, came forth with, with a proposal to us um, stating that there were four services that they wanted each of our 19 campuses to provide in some form or another, um, which is food security, mental health counseling, um, transportation, and emergency funds. Um, and so strategy 1.1 of our strategic plan is, is operationalizing this and finding a way to make that happen. So this comes under that vice chancellor for student success position. Um, and it's something that we are working to implement at all 19 of our campuses right now. Project Jumpstart is essentially a summer bridge program um, for students, um, which we piloted at the Indianapolis campus in the summer of 2017. Um, in the summer um, of 2018, a week before the fall semester started, um, we did expand to other campuses as well. Um, so this is a week-long initiative. Um, in the morning, typically, students go through a one credit hour student success course, or IBYT course. Um, and then in the afternoon, um, they tend to have a variety of different areas. So it can be an orientation to the campus, what the different offices are, but also if they um, might not test college ready and might need a remedial course, um, they can go through a program to help bring them up to college ready in reading, writing, or in math. So that way that next week when classes start, they're ready to go in that 100 level class and don't need to go into remediation at all. So they can work through that program, take the test again at the end, and then be ready to go um, in that college level course. Um, typically, also over the lunch hour, um, we do bring in somebody from industry to talk to students about um, one of the hot jobs um, to help start the networking conversation with students as well as to show them what is out there and what they can be thinking about um, as they begin their educational journey. Um, we've begun offering new student orientation, um, a face-to-face -face orientation in the past because of volume, we had to do it all online. Um, we have started to do this face-to-face -face for students as well to help connect them to the campus. Um, and then we have continued student success coaching um, through Inside Track, which I'll talk more a little bit about in just a minute. Um, we have a, identified six different groups that we know where there are achievement gaps as well. Um, and these are historically area, uh, groups of students that we have had lower success rates. So everything from African American males and Latino males to women in STEM, as well as our online students and students with dependents. Um, each campus has identified at least one, in some cases two of these groups that they are work working on and focusing on. So it could be initiatives. In some cases it's dedicated advisors to work with these students um, to help build relationships and again connect them to our campuses as well. As I mentioned, there's a lot here, um, but just to explain, um, this is a history of our relationship with Inside Track. So we began it in um, fall of 2014 um, through the grant, um, through CHE, through USA Funds at the time, um, to work with our 21st century scholar students. We have continued to expand it every single year and to include new groups of students. So right now, for one year, we provide um, coaching to all of our new 21st century scholar students, as well as African-American students statewide. Um, for a full year. Um, 
in the beginning of the fall and the beginning of the spring semester, we also provide a short-term coaching, so about two months, from about a month before the semester starts to a month in, to our online students as well, about 2,500 online students each semester, to make sure that they have the resources and tools necessary, they know what to expect, um, they know where to go to log in, to you know, find a syllabus, um, and really make sure that they're, they're set to prepare, and we call that strong start, because we want them to get off to a strong start as well. We have added um, capacity building coaching training, so we have brought them to our campus to provide coaching training to make some of our staff coaches um, so that they can implement those techniques when they work with our students. Last year we also did a train the trainer model um, so that they could take that back to their campuses as well um, to work with faculty, staff, advisors, and other people. What are the techniques? So they're not necessarily full-fledged trainers, but when they're having a conversation with a student, um, they can ask about what is, go what is going on with your life? What are some of the barriers? Um, what is your plan to actually get through the completion? Have you thought about how you're going to manage your time um, and, some of the, and juggle the other commitments that are going on in your life to do that? So to really help them think through what those plans are um, as well. So another way that we're working to build capacity to better support our students as well. Um, but we know, as I said, some of, some of our students could be categorized as at risk, but all of them need extra support. So we have really worked to provide a lot of additional support. Um, first and foremost, we're working um, to scale at um, eight-week courses. Um, we know that burnout tends to happen about 10 weeks into a semester, um, and we know that students have complicated lives. Um, they have a lot of things going on. They have families. They have work commitments. So being able to schedule in an eight-week format, they can focus on half the number of classes. Typically, it's one to three classes at a time instead of four or five, um, so that way they can manage everything going on in their life right now. Um, currently, roughly about a third of our classes are in an online format. Um, but come this fall, we'll continue to scale that up even higher. Um, we're, we plan to be at full implementation by fall of 2021 as we continue to increase that, uh, increase the number of courses we have, um, but also continue with the professional development for our faculty and st staff to support this. We're also rethinking how we offer online classes through an online academic unit, um, and so pulling it in centrally um, so that way students just register for one section instead of having it at the campus level. So that way we know every course section is going to fill um, because we know our data has shown us that students actually do better when it, the course is at capacity and not when it's a course of seven or eight students. Um, it also helps us maximize resources as well and think about how we can provide some of those other instructional supports to those students as well. Um, so we're beginning an alpha implementation of that this fall with um, two, two programs and a select group of courses that we offer through the ICAP high school dual credit online program as well. And we'll continue to, to scale that as we learn from it and move on as well. Project Early Success is using predictive analytics to identify students who are at risk of failing a course. So we know within one week of the beginning of the semester, students who are in an eight week course with 80% accuracy who is likely to fail a course. So we can immediately intervene. Um, typically we have an advisor reach out to them or somebody else from the campus. In some cases it's also the, also the faculty member who actually teaches them um, who can pull them aside after class or before class and say, you know, I, not, not everything seems to be going as smoothly as we would like right now. You know, is there something I can do to help? Let's, let's talk and kind of create a game plan here to get you back on track. Um, for 16 week courses, it's after the second week in the semester as well. So we do this each semester as well. Um, this is our third year now of Project Early Success. Uh, yeah, third year of Project Early Success. Um, advising is an area where we have put a lot of resources in over the last seven to eight years. Um, we're currently about one to 400 students. Um, right now, all new students are required to see an advisor to register for classes the first time. Um, we just went to a new model this fall um, where students have one advisor throughout their academic career. Before, after their first semester or second semester, they would transition to a faculty advisor. We now have them stay with a professional advisor in our advising center through the entire year um, because we know students would come in over break or during the summer and their faculty member might not be there. So this gives them a constant point of contact throughout their educational career. Um, but they still then also have a faculty advisor um, who can talk to them about career issues or if they have specific uh, questions about a program um, as well that maybe the advisor can't handle or can't answer that they can work with um, as well. So they do have dual um, advisors. Um, we are looking to expand this to all students, so students would need to see an advisor every single semester um, going forward. Um, hopefully our target right now is in the fall that we can expand that to all of our students as well. Um, during that meeting with an advisor, um, a couple of things happened in addition to just talking about what is, what's, your, what's your plan and what's your path. 
um, we have divided up all of our programs into quadrants um, to align with what our graduates are and what the needs of the workforce are as well. So if they're in a program where maybe we have way more graduates and there aren't a lot of jobs, we can talk to them about, so what are your general interests? And let's talk about other programs that might be of interest to you as well. Um, so helping them align their interests with workforce. Um, we also work to create an academic um, completion plan, so all the courses you need to complete. Um, and it, it is that point that we also talk about the Workforce Ready Grant. So their first meeting with an advisor, um, if they're in a program that is eligible or might be eligible, um, we have that conversation with them right away before they even start class to get them into the grant if, if they are eligible. We also have an early alert system, which is a combination of automated as well as um, faculty and staff raise flags. So if a student misses the first class, a faculty member can raise that flag. Or if they just have a general academic concern, um, they can also raise a flag. And we have surveys that go out to faculty um, to um, solicit that. Um, but we also have automated flags as well. So if a student fails all of their courses, a flag is generated in the system, an advisor knows to reach out to them. At midterm, if they have a D or an F, the same thing happens, so an advisor can um, reach out to them. The nice thing about our system is um, people can also raise kudos. So it's not just is something going wrong, but a student can also hear about if they're doing well. Because um, we know that sometimes students don't necessarily know. They, they see a grade, but they still might have that little bit of self-doubt. And so a faculty member or even a staff member can go in and raise a kudo to let the student know, hey, you're doing a great job, you're on the right track, keep it up, just to give them that little bit of encouragement to go with it to help support them. Um, satisfa satisfactory academic progress, so if a student, um, as with the other institutions you've heard from, drop below 2.0, um, they do go on academic or SAP warning, um, they have a semester to get that back above a 2.0. Um, they can monitor that online um, through an intranet site um, that students can log into with their regular credentials. They receive regular communications throughout the semester from an advisor and as well as from financial aid. So if they're in a class that's you know, an eight-week class or something else that doesn't span the entire semester, they're constantly getting updates throughout the semester so they don't have to wait till the very end to know that there might be an issue as well. Students who do lose um, eligibility for financial aid or who are in academic um, dismissal as well, um, can appeal. If their appeal is approved at many of our campuses, we have what we call our STAR program, um, which is students taking academic responsibility, um, which is a requirement then of being able to continue. Um, so as part of that, they have to update their academic completion plan, and then they also have to meet with a coach weekly um, as another way to make sure that they are staying on track. We also have a second chance scholarship at our Indianapolis campus.